Good morning, everybody. Also want to say hello to the West Portsmouth campus and all the many hundreds watching online. It's wonderful to join you on Sunday morning. Great to have you here. We're looking now at Colossians chapter number 2, beginning with verse 8. And we're reading down to the end of verse number 12 of Colossians chapter number 2. I'm going to spend some time in chapter number 2. We've already started there. We're moving into it more today. Let me say that Paul covers a lot of territory in chapter 2, and it's very difficult stuff. And it's going to take me several messages in the coming weeks to get through what chapter 2 says. But I think that even though it's a struggle for us, I know it was a struggle for me studying and working to speak to you today, I think it's a very rewarding thing, and you will be glad that you did it when you get through it. So here we are, begin to read with verse 8 of chapter number 2. Be on screens for you as well. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands, your whole self Ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now we're dealing with this heresy, this false teaching that Paul was fighting, one that was coming into the Colossian church and other churches of that area. And, and this is important because the same false teachings that Paul was dealing with are things that are being taught now. And so when we master what Paul says here about the heresies, the false teachings that they were dealing with, we will be able to be stronger now as we hear false teachings. Now I know, and I'm repeating myself, but I've said this several times, I know that we're not a college or seminary classroom. And we're smart people. We really are. But you know, we don't have that, that, that academic uh, thing going on. So when we talk about some really deep and difficult issues, it can cause us to struggle a great deal. I think, and I'm going to say this later on in my message, I think that one of the reasons that God wants pastors and teachers to be gifted to God's church is so that they can help us understand difficult issues and see deeper into God's Word. And this is really interesting about God's Word. You can understand salvation in a moment. Anybody can. Anybody can grasp how Christ died for them on the cross and be saved. But it takes a lifetime to understand all that what God wants us to get and understand. And isn't that great? What a challenge we have. And that challenge, that struggle is worth the struggle. And so Paul talks about some difficult things. He says that with intention, we should guard against false teaching. Now the word intention there means that we should make a decision. Our lives, in general, should be intentional. Paul says elsewhere that we should make the most of every opportunity. And what Paul means by that is that we should be walking through life looking for chances to learn, to grow, and to serve God. And so we're living life with the, with the inclination, the desire, the, 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 the thought that we're going to be making decisions about how we live our lives. We'll be living our lives with intention. Don't just let life happen to you. Live it with intention. And we should face false teaching with intention. We should understand that there is false teaching, that people are saying things that are wrong, they are leading people astray into believing things they should not believe. We should not be naive or surprised that there's false teaching, and we should, with a, 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 an intention, a decision, face it head on. We have a great blessing. It's a great blessing. We have freedom of speech, we have freedom of religion, you can turn on the TV, you can pick up a book, you can turn on the radio, you can watch something on, on YouTube, and you can hear all kinds of preachers and teachers from all different kinds of churches saying all kinds of things. That's a blessing, but it also is a danger because much of what we hear, much of what we are told is not true. It's a false teaching. And you should be even wary of me. You should take what I say and run it through the filter of the Holy Spirit with your own mind, your own abilities, as God gives you the ability to understand, 
and you shouldn't even take from me as being the gospel unless it actually is the gospel. And that, that, that uh, exercise of looking and studying and thinking will help make you stronger. You should not be surprised that there's so much false teaching. Now, oftentimes false teaching, Paul says it's deceptive. It comes across very attractive. There'll be a great church, large in number. The platform will be filled with, with, with talented singers. The pastor comes out and he's strikingly handsome. And you know what I'm going to say, don't you? He's a whole full head of hair. <laughs> and you listen to all this and you say, look at all these people. Look at how attractive this is. Look at how skilled he is in making his arguments. And you just get sucked in, drawn in. Paul says, seek. You hear it now? That's intention. Seek to understand that you can be led astray. Seek out the truth and not falsehood. Now, Paul says there are some marks of false teaching. He says it's hollow. It's deceptive. It makes arguments which seem to be good, but which are not resting on Scripture and what the gospel's already always taught. Let me stop for a moment. We have the historic Christian faith. That's what you should be striving to understand. Meaning this, ever since Jesus and the apostles and the Church fathers, those men taught by the apostles in their early church. The church has believed about Jesus and about the gospel and about salvation the same thing. For 2,000 years we've been believing the same thing. And, and you have to understand that, that if somebody comes along and teaches something different than the historic Christian faith, that by definition is wrong and it's false. No matter how deceptive it might be, it's hollow. It looks good on the outside, kind of like a hot air balloon. Hot air balloons are always very well painted. They look really great, you know. And people want to get up into them. Not me, but people do. But inside of a hot air balloon, all you got is hot air. It's hollow. It's empty. It has no substance. So Paul says this false teaching is hollow. It's deceptive. It's empty. And here's why. It's based on human tradition. It's what comes out of things outside of the gospel. Many of them superstitions. Many of them false religions. And these things are brought in by the teachers. And because they bring it in, because it's not based on the gospel, it's human. Humans always do exactly the same thing. They believe false things and they mess up their lives. And it's based on the elemental spirits of the universe. Whoa, whoa, what in the world does that mean? Well, in the ancient times, people believed, the philosophers taught, that the world was made out of four elements. Earth, wind, fire, and water. Now, I've always wanted to ask the rock group, why they left out water? You know, earth, wind, and fire, where did the water go? Anyway, I'll ask them one day. And, and uh, these things, they, they, they taught that spirits move through the earth, the wind, the air, and the, and, and the earth, the wind, the fire, and the water. So there were spirits inhabiting these things. And then it came to be believed that when you went to elementary school, what was the equivalent of elementary school, that, that uh, you were taught these things, and so they were, they were taught to be the elements, the ABCs of understanding and of education. Some translations actually use and translate here ABCs to uh, express that, that, that basic teaching. But by Paul's, day, by Paul's day, it had come to be believed and taught that these were the basic principles of pagan religion. Witchcraft. Pagan understandings of the world, including infant sacrifice. Crystals. Chemicals used to enhance the body, enhance the mind. Drugs. And, and, and so Paul was saying that the people come into you, they're teaching these things which come right out of pagan religion. And so we got this idea is that these false teachers were using Christian elements and Jewish elements and pagan elements and mix them all into a religion that was extraordinarily attractive because it offered so much. Really, all false. Now listen, listen, listen. 
If you read your horoscope, do it as entertainment. It has no more power than the fortune cookie you get at the Chinese restaurant. If you buy a crystal, buy it because you think it's attractive and it feels good in your hand when you move it around. Maybe it relaxes you a little bit because you move it around, but it has no power in it whatsoever to change your life. If you buy a fragrant oil, buy it because you like the smell. Me personally, I don't like any of the smells, but you know, if you, you like the smell, buy it because you like the smell. Buy it because it makes your skin feel soft after a bath. I don't know. But it has no spiritual power. Maybe you've heard of the secret. Well, there is a secret. That secret is Jesus Christ dying on the cross for your sins. It's not some secret idea about how the universe works, and once you delve into it, you're going to have a life of wealth and power. In witchcraft, it may be funny on a TV show, but there are no spirits living in rocks and trees and flowers that can change your life. Paul says, these element, are you getting this? These elemental things that are the basic of pagan religion, they may seem very attractive, they may seem so powerful in what people say, but they are not real. And even if they were, Paul says, Jesus has authority over every spirit, over all of creation. And even if they were real, all the power really comes from him. Now, why are people attracted to this? Why are they? Why are they attracted to things like are found in pagan religions? And I think it is because people want to have a shortcut to happiness and power and a good life. And, you know, believing in Jesus is easy to believe in him, but the, the struggle and the life ahead after believing in Jesus takes a whole lifetime. And why do you want to go through that when you just grab a hold of something that's going to give you some magic? Now, I'm going to talk about golf for a moment, and you're going to say, he's talking about golf again. No, oh, it hurts so much. Well, I believe in transferable principles. And by the way, if I was a, a, a guy who baked cakes, I probably would use transferable principles from baking cakes. In fact, I actually did bake a cake this year. I baked one of the most delicious cakes I've ever had. It was fantastic. My whole family loved that cake. But I had learned nothing from it. <laughs> But, it, 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 you know, I used to even teach golf. I, used to talk, I taught golf in college, believe it or not. And um, people want us to play golf well, and they think that the club or the ball is the secret. I'm going to buy the right club and the right ball, and that's going to do it for me. And what that person is saying is, I don't want to practice. I don't want to play. I don't want to learn the basics and the principles. I don't want to learn the skill. Who wants to do that? That's hard work. If I just get the right club and ball, it's all going to be so easy. And that's not true. There are no shortcuts. If you want to play good golf or you want to make good cakes, you better learn your principles. You better practice your skills. And Paul is saying here, the reason these people like these false teachings, the reason they're taught the way they are, is because people, people take it and have a shortcut to grace. And the only shortcut to grace is Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. Now listen, the moment you believe you have everything, you have everything that God gives people who are saved. You have all you need, the moment you believe. Now Paul reminds us of chapter 1, when he said that in Jesus the fullness of God dwelt in bodily form. And we talked about that at the time, that fullness there means completeness, which means that Jesus was completely God. All that God was dwelled in him. And we talked about uh, God in a human suit and how that was a heresy. Do you remember this? I even told a great joke about it. You remember this? Okay, yeah, yeah. God in a human suit. Now, now, that's not correct. That's a heresy because... Jesus was fully God and fully man. He was both in nature God and both in nature man. We should not diminish the, diminish the, the, the humanness of Jesus. So, so Paul's reminding us of that, that the human Jesus had all the fullness of God live in him, and now you have been given fullness in Christ. You have been given completeness in Jesus. You don't need anything else but Jesus. 
You don't need any of the superstitions that people follow around the world. You don't need those. You don't need any religion or any teaching that leads you to believe that you have to have something to give you power. All you need is Jesus. You have fullness in Christ. You have everything that you're supposed to have. Now, um, I am sometimes told by people, not you, of course, but, <laughs> but people, that, uh, you know, Ernie, that's one of those preacher things. You make stuff up, you know. You just say things. It's your opinion. And I've already told you you should take what I say and run it through the filter of the Holy Spirit. You should do that. But, you know, I think that God provides preachers and teachers to his church. He has the idea of gifting to provide preachers and teachers so that we can puzzle through and hear teaching and help us understand these difficult passages. And so a pastor or preacher or teacher, his preaching should be just about Scripture, should be Scripture and only Scripture because we need to have it opened up to us. This reminds me of the first joke I heard as a Christian. I was 16 years old, and I, heard, I, just, I just started going to church, and as the first joke I heard, and I don't want, I'm going to tell it to you, but I don't want you to get your hopes up. It's not that funny. Well, you know, there's something about the first joke you ever hear as a Christian. You know, there's something about that. So this pastor's preaching in his church, and he looks into the foyer, and he sees people going through the pocketbooks and the coats. And he says, there, there's somebody going through the purses and the coats. Nobody does a thing. And once again, he says, there's somebody going through the purses and the coats. Nobody does anything. And finally, he yells, there's somebody <laughs> going through the purses and the coats. Nobody moves. The service ends, and people start yelling, we've been robbed, we've been robbed, we've been robbed. And the pastor says, I told you three times. And one of the deacons says, yeah, we thought it was one of those preacher things. I told you not to get your hopes up. So, you know, somebody says, well, you know, hey, he's just one, of those, that's just one of those preacher things he's talking about. You know, he's making it mostly up. Listen, there is an historic Christian faith. And part of that is this wonderful idea that you are complete in Jesus. You have everything God wants you to have. Now, maturity means that you're saved, but as you learn Scripture and you're growing and you have experiences of applying Scripture to life, you, you slowly begin to mature and unlock the powers that God has given you. You may not have them on day one, but by day 10 years, you're much different. By day, so I've been a Christian now, can you believe it, for over 50 years. And I'm still growing and still learning, still maturing. You know, uh, I'm not a... A, a full convert to the church of the electric car. <laughs> I can, I'm going to get in trouble. You know, but Tesla makes a great car. They do. And, and one of my sons really loves Tesla. And I expect one day, look out the window of my house and see him pulling up in a Tesla. I really expect that. Uh, but it's a good car. Uh, but they, there's, there's something that they do that I saw a long time ago. I've been in the computer uh, world ever since the computer's became personal computers. It's been since 1984 I've been in computers. And I saw this before because what, they, what the companies would do, they would sell you software, and then after you bought the software, they would unlock the features by paying them some more money. So you pay a little bit to get in, and you have to unlock features. And they do this now with, with video games. You, you buy a video game, and then that's when the money starts, right? People don't like this. They rebelled against it. But Tesla does this with their cars. Uh, uh, and some of the features of the other cars, some of the things, you know, when you buy a gasoline-powered car, you can buy a stripped-down model or you can buy the, the top-of-the-line model. It's, it's basically the same car, but they add things. You actually can see them add this stuff, you know, what kind of transmission you have, what kind of engine you have, horsepower, whatever. You can see them adding these things. But with a Tesla, you have an app on your phone, and you buy the car, and then later on you decide, I want to have more battery power. You can, for $4,500, you can push a button on your phone. It pulls money out of your bank account and now you have increased range in your car. You, I know, you look... <laughs> oh, isn't that something, right? 
The money never stops. You can get more features on your car by just pushing a button on your phone, but you got to pay four thousand five hundred. I think if you get to the very top of the line, you get to pay like fifteen thousand more uh, over a period of time. I'm sorry I got folks so far into this. I talked about it too long, but I want you to hear this. It's very much like your spiritual life. When you enter into it, you're saved and you have everything that you can possibly have. You may not just be able to access it all yet. But you don't need one of the false teachers to tell you with something which is not the gospel. You need to get into the, into the Word, into the Spirit, listen, learn, grow, mature. There's no shortcuts, but it will happen. Now, last thing, and this is going to take a while, so I don't know what's going to happen. You, are you all hungry yet? You are marked when you believe as belonging to God. Paul says you were circumcised with a circumcision that was not of human hands. Now, we're in trouble right away because we don't know much about circumcision as, as a spiritual practice. We don't know much about this. But in many of the Hebrew people, they were commanded in the law of Moses to circumcise every male by the eighth day. And that marked the male as being a part of God's people. And evidently, these false teachers who took Christian, Jewish, and pagan elements and mixed them together in religion were teaching that if you want to be a Christian, you believe in Jesus, that's good, but you also have to be circumcised. Now, I don't want to, to, to make too much of this. Because I might get myself in trouble. But if you're doing evangelism of men, and you tell them that they want to be a, be a Christian and believe in Jesus, also got to be circumcised, not much evangelism is going to be going on. This is a big problem. You see the problem? Big problem. And it's so unnecessary because you, a person who believes in Christ, Jesus does everything for you. You don't need a mark of some kind. Paul says, oh, yes, yes, you have a mark, but it's done invisibly for both men and women the moment they believe in Jesus. The moment they believe. And so if you believe in Jesus then God has marked you in your spirit as belonging to Him. You've been circumcised in the invisible nature of your spirit. Now, Paul parallels that with baptism. So you've been circumcised and you've been baptized. The, if you take the parallelism here, if you take the two side by side, if circumcision is invisible, then the baptism he's talking about here is also invisible. This is profound. You've got to get this. The moment, and by the way, the word baptism means immerse, usually in water, but can immerse in anything. The moment Jesus died, his real death on the cross, it was a real death, and was buried in the ground, you were there with him. You were immersed in his death. When, you were when he was buried in the ground, you were buried there with him. You are baptized into Jesus. And then that baptism, immersion, you put into something, you always come out. His resurrection was coming out of that death, and you came out with him, and you left your sins in the grave there with him, and now you live forgiven. You live without sin, although as a, as a human being and weak and not yet mature, you still sin. But, but, but spiritually speaking, you have the power over sin you didn't have before. When you're buried in the ground, you come out in resurrection, you have a new life. This is a spiritual baptism, and it's real. And I want you to hang with me, okay? There's a difference between spiritual baptism and physical baptism. There's a difference here between baptism and circumcision. Because, because we're not commanded to circumcise... But we are commanded by Jesus to baptize. And so what, what, the, what the New Testament teaches is that we have a physical water baptism, which is public, to show to everyone that we've had the spiritual baptism first. And so we act out the fact we died and we're buried with Jesus in the grave by going into the water, and we act out coming out of the water to a resurrection and a new life born again. And so... There's a sequence here, and I want you to follow the sequence. We believe, and by believing, convert it. 
Remember conversion? I talked about it last week. Changed from one thing to another. We believe we're converted. Marked by God, by Jesus in the Spirit, with a spiritual circumcision. Baptized in a spiritual, circumc- spiritual experience so that we have death and resurrection with Jesus. And then that experience of, of, of spiritual baptism is shown publicly by water baptism. That's the sequence. Now, I'm a Baptist. I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm proud of it. But, you know, a lot of folks, we have a lot of people come from many, many different uh, backgrounds in our church, many watching online from different backgrounds. And I respect your experience, what you had when you were a child or what you did in your denomination when you were growing up. I respect that. I, I honor it. I know it has meaning and importance for you. So in no way do I want to diminish what you went through. And, um, and I talked about this at starting point in our class of new members. Um, I'll mention what baptism is and what it's about, but I will never bludgeon you, push you, pressure you to be baptized. I won't do that. I trust that the Holy, if, if, you, if the Holy Spirit works in you and you hear the teaching of Scripture, then you'll make your own decision. And whatever you do, we're going to accept you and love you forever. But we're still a Baptist church, and I'm still a Baptist. And, you know, you ought to expect when you go to Baptist church that Baptists believe what Baptists believe. Which reminds me of one of my favorite jokes. I love this joke. I told this joke right before COVID, so it's been almost four years. So you forgot already. But this guy goes into an establishment, walks up to the counter and says, I'd like to have a moon pie and an RC cola. One of the great delicacies of the South, you know. When I told this joke four years ago, Jason Nye, who's over at the West Portland campus right now listening, Jason Nye, the music guy, is over at the West Portland campus listening. I said, Jason, you ever had a moon pie? He said, no. So I brought a box of moon pies and a, and a whole bunch of RC cola to a staff meeting, and we all had RC colas and moon pies together. And I said, Jason, how like your moon pie? He goes, meh. <laughs> oh, well, you know. So anyway, a guy goes to the establishment, he asks for an RC cola and a moon pie, and a guy behind the counter says, you must be from North Carolina. And he says, I'm so offended. If I came in and ordered cheese and crackers, you think I was from Wisconsin? If I came in and ordered a glass of orange juice, you think I was from Florida? Why do you think I'm from North Carolina? Because I ordered a moon pie and an RC cola. And the guy behind the counter says, because this is a hardware store. Oh, my, one of my favorite jokes. You should be rolling the aisle, I'll tell you. Well, you don't go into a hardware store and order a moon pie and an RC cola. You don't do that. Something must be wrong with you. Not that something's wrong for people in North Carolina. I'm not trying to imply that. When you go to a hardware store, you get, what do you do? You buy a hammer, screwdriver, some penny nails. That's what you do when you go to a hardware store, right? So you go to a Baptist church. What do you think Baptists believe? But it's not just because of Baptists. Did, did you follow what Paul's logic was here? He says you believe are converted, marked in a spiritual circumcision, experience spiritual baptism, immersed with Christ in the tomb, resurrected with him, and then which is shown by water baptism that that was your experience by the command of Jesus. So, intentionally face false teaching. Don't let it take you astray. You have everything you're supposed to have in Jesus the moment you believe. And remember, you're marked in your spirit as belonging to God. And nothing can take that away from you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're praying now that we'll listen to what Paul said, live intentional lives. And part of that intention is to face up the false teaching, know its faults, and not let it pull us astray, to believe in superstitions that have no power, but to recognize the moment we believe we have everything we're supposed to have in Jesus. And we pray that we will understand that we're marked in our spirits with a circumcision not made with human hands. We've endured a spiritual baptism that makes us part of the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
I pray right now for those people here watching online, those at West Portsmouth, will believe now in Jesus if they haven't believed before, that all these sins can belong to them. If you're that person, pray this prayer with me. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands. And I pray you'll forgive me based on what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross and come and live inside of me by the power of the Holy Spirit that I might know that I'm saved. And I pray this in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer with me, let me know with the form provided on the, in the, in, on the worship program, the card in the chair. Talk to an online counselor. If, if you, as you leave, you can drop it in the offering box at the back. You can go to the Welcome Center and leave it there with one of the people working in the center. We'll stay in touch with you, share with you more how you can grow in your faith. And now, Father, we pray we'll leave this place certain in what we believe. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to drop us a like, subscribe, or follow us on social media so you don't miss any future content from DC Church.